In agriculture in general, we've had an influence on the behavior and, and the diet of these birds quite dramatically. Uh, the American crow shown here eating corn is, is really a corn specialist in many parts of its range. And during the planting season and harvest season throughout uh, the, the U.S. and into Canada, uh, these animals specialize on corn and they eat a, a lot of it and the insects associated with it. That's allowed them to spread their distribution much further north than it was uh, in recent times. And because of that northward spread and the seasonality of this crop, our culture of, of um, planting and harvesting, they've developed migratory behaviors. And we know at least in other species of birds, migratory behavior is, is a learned behavior initially could be socially passed on as flocks of animals are migrating together and observing and learning from one another that could then become a genetically uh, encoded trait. So perhaps the migratory behavior of some crow populations, they're not all migratory, is in response to our culture of, of planting and harvesting these seeds which they like. And this is a long-standing sort of influence we've had on them. This plate that's shown here is from the Membrace culture of New Mexico. It's a thousand-year-old plate that shows a crow trapper in the middle there holding some nooses that he has strung around a fence here that protects his corn, which are the little X's on the ground there. And three crows are hanging from that fence, having been captured by the hunter. And in fact, that's one of the most effective deterrents, scarecrows, that there ever uh, is, is for other birds to see those three hanging. And perhaps that's why these other two crows are walking away. <laughs> Perhaps the hunter here already had the same idea that, well, they're learning from each other, seeing their fallen comrades, and also learning by walking off uh, together not to do that, to stay out of his corn. A good example of this, I think, comes from Japan, where uh, there's pretty complex interaction of these uh, carrion crows uh, with our uh, various aspects, aspects of our culture. So the first one is that we like to plant things, that, plants that we enjoy, in and around where we live. So in Japan, the example here is that, we've, that they brought in walnuts and planted walnut trees in, in the cities around, or the streets around Tokyo. Those walnuts grew up, produced great crops of nuts, which a crow can't resist because it's a big uh, fleshy nut once it's cracked open, but they can't crack it with their bill. So they developed a new foraging strategy, which is shown here where the bird flies down with a nut and places it in front of a stopped car. <laughs> then waits, flies away, waits for the car and the traffic to start up again, run over the nut, crack it, stop again, and then the bird goes down. And they even do this preferentially in places in crosswalks where it's safe to walk back and forth after the cars have stopped <laughs> and go down and get the nuts. And this, this has had a probably a socially learned component to it. The top map there shows the spread of the behavior, the numbers of the years when it was observed. So in 1975, it was first observed, this nutcracking, by this driving school, and it's only spread a few kilometers in a couple of decades. So that suggests that birds didn't just come up with this on their own many different places and start it up, but instead it spread more like a learned trait would, and therefore we can think of it as a culture of nutcracking by these particular crows in Japan. And crows drop nuts around here, but to our knowledge they don't place them on the road like this. So they've tried this strategy many places, but here one of them innovated something, or a few of them innovated something quite unique, and the others copied it as best as we can tell. And then what was interesting is I asked uh, Professor Higuchi what the people do in response to this now, because this has been on uh, videos and out, and, and people in Japan are aware of the interesting things their crows do. And I said, well, uh, what, what do the people do? Kind of thinking they probably try to run over the crow. But in fact, they really try to hit the nut now. <laughs> So that's back and forth. That's the kind of back and forth culture of driving, planting, culture of foraging by the crows that I think is going on in many cases, but it's difficult to, to tie all the pieces together. So why do crows do this? Why, why is it crows and ravens and not, it might be gulls, raccoons, other species like this. Crows and ravens are pretty smart. They have large brains. They live with us, and they're social, so they can learn from one another. I think those are key ingredients. I'll give you some examples of that now. First off, just their, to put their brains into perspective. Okay? This is a typical way that we use to show the relative um, brain size of, a, of an animal. And it's brain size on the 
uh, y-axis and body size on the x because small animals have small brains just because they're small. And big animals have big brains just because they're big. What we're interested in is how unusually big or small are they. So for example, ostriches are well below the average bird line. That's what the line is there from hummingbirds up to the word birds. So ostriches, you know, you, you got that image. They're pin, pinheaded for the most part. They're well below the average brain size for a big, uh, big bird. In general, fish have smaller brains than birds. That's why their line is below the bird line. And then mammals have bigger brains on for a given body size than birds do. We typically think of them as smarter. And then primates even well above the mammal line. Well, look where all the corvids, the jays and rooks and crows and ravens line up. They're, they're up there on the mammal line and some of them on the primate line. Some of the big parrots, the macaws, are even larger brained for their body sizes and they're well above and or I'd say on the primate line. Yeah, and you can rest uh, with a little bit of ease in that we're still above the primate line. <laughs> it may be going down, I, I don't know. But early man, Australopithecus uh, at least, was right on that line and so perhaps competing with some relatively similarly brainy birds at the time when, when we were evolving. And we know that the brain of a bird is very complex. Uh, it's, not, it's not the same structure that a mammal has, the neocortex isn't, but it's similarly complex, similarly wired in, ex in really uh, intricate circuitry, and even uh, to the point where half of the brain is used for similar sorts of analytical um, strategies and problem solving as we do. And that's shown here with this new Caledonian crow, which is holding a stick tool that it's made, uh, to probe insects out of crevices in, on the islands of New Caledonia where it lives. What's interesting about this is you can see the way it's sitting there with the tool coming like this. It's using its right eye when it goes in and fishes out insects. So its left brain is engaged with that sort of analytical um, problem solving behavior. Song learning also is in, in birds is a left brain activity. So their brain is lateralized uh, just as it is in mammals to perform particular tasks very well and subdivide those tasks. They're also not only big brained as I said, but they are with us and they are social. So they can perhaps learn good people like this woman uh, down here, Phyllis, who feeds crows every day and is mobbed by a flock every day and they follow her and they know her. As soon as she comes onto a, the scene, the crows are there with her versus the guy up here who hunts them, which I bet the crows he didn't shoot also know him and stay away from him in a very uh, real way. So they need, if they live with us, because we are different. And we might even change throughout our lifetime of how we feel about these birds. They need to know that. They need to be able to respond to those differences in a species like us, which has got to be a challenge to live with. So we started to try to understand this, and I'll show you a little bit of uh, some experiments that we've done with this. And the first question we had was, could they tell our face? When, when we would catch birds, which we routinely do to study them, we shoot a net over them. They're trapped on the ground. We run up, we grab them. We hold them for 10 or 15 minutes while we apply a, a leg band, colored leg band to their leg, and we let them go. So we can tell them apart later. We always kind of thought after we did that, they didn't view us the same way as they viewed other people. They would tend to stay away from us or even uh, attack us at times. And so we thought they recognized us, and other people who studied birds thought they recognized them. But uh, we decided to do an easy experiment. So we caught birds, uh, in this case, on the University of Washington campus, and we wore this mask, the caveman mask. <laughs> and we wore, actually, a straw hat with it. And I thought that was kind of fun, and we could compare it to the response of birds to another mask. <laughs> Which American crows certainly could tell this difference, we thought. I don't know about the Canadian ones. And we compared their responses to Cheney versus the caveman uh, before and after the capture of them wearing the caveman mask. And the results are shown here. So before we caught any birds, this, the first three dots there just show that crows don't scold or come after or attack us. I'll show you a little video in a second of what this behavior is. But they don't do much of it before we caught them. After we caught them, they didn't do it uh, to us when we wore no mask, that's that low circle with the 11 above it. 
They did it uh, a little bit more to Dick Cheney, even though we didn't use him in the catching of that. They did it a lot. I must say, though, that was the time where he shot his friend Quail Honey. Just by, I mean, it was not planned, but that is when it happened. And so maybe they were alerted to his face. But they certainly responded strongly to the caveman, whether we wore it with the hat or without the hat or even just the hat or the face upside down. And the face upside down is interesting because mammals don't recognize faces very well when they're inverted like that. We tend to recognize them if they're in the right position. But uh, crows, and we found since then pigeons, also recognize upside down faces. And you think about it, as a, as a bird moves through the world, it's off, often up above looking down at us, or it's down on the ground walking and looking up. So the ability to transposition the face and recognize it from many of these angles, it's not surprising and in fact, even sometimes when we did these experiments, the crows would come up to us as we had the upside down mask on and they would stand there like this and they'd turn their heads <laughs> upside down and look at us. So they're making these corrections and wondering, you know, what the heck's up with that? 